Um, yeah, thanks for uh, such a nice intro in in introduction, Simon. Um, hello, everyone. Again, I'm Gyeong Jun Lee from University of Maryland College Park. Um, today, I'm so delighted to present our work, hands holding clues for object recognition in teachable machines. And actually, in the last few days, I saw that audience become very supportive. Is if you know presenter is presenting for the first time at Kai. So actually, this is my first time presenting at Kai. So please, you know, it would be great if you can share, um, you know, any thought uh, and feedback at the end of my talk. Um, actually, so this um, work is, could be a little bit different domain for about what you're expecting. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more context of what I'm working on um, first. And actually, this is joint work with my wonderful advisor, Hernisa Kachori. Um, so every day, uh, humans, people interact with so many objects. For example, in the morning, a person may be interacting with objects such as smartphone, um, cereal box, milk, shampoo, and clothes, which may be the ones you did interact in this morning. To make necessary interactions with these objects, it is essential to recognize the object first. And depending on the level of vision the person has, the way of recognizing object would be different because the visual features of an object contain a lot of information for recognition. So um, let's assume that there are, very, um, there are two very different objects. One is a cereal box and another is the soda can you can find here in Scotland. Uh, sight, sighted people would be able to distinguish these two objects by simply looking at their labels. Also, blind people can distinguish these items by touching the objects or making and hearing their sound. But what if there are very, uh, what if there are two similar objects? For example, one a regular iron brew soda and another is a sugar-free iron brew soda, as I'm showing in this slide. In this case, touching and hearing would not be as much helpful as before, especially for people with visual impairments to recognize these objects. It's because they have a same shape and are made of same materials. Then how would blind uh, people would distinguish these items? Uh, blind people may put a braid label so that they can recognize it later. But as you can imagine, putting a braid label on every single item may not be practical, especially if the item is disposable. Um, they could ask sighted people through FaceTime or any other um, uh, like a video conference call uh, for, um, to help recognize the object, or some of the assist technologies can help them to recognize this object. However, often these kind of assist technologies give a little bit kind of coarse grain level of recognition. For example, here, instead of recognizing this iron brew soda as iron brew soda, it just recognized as soda can. But what if we can actually empower people with visual impairments um, to uh, have them their own recognizer by training their own objects with their own, own label? If we can do that, we can actually um, you know, give them a fine grained um, recognition, whatever level they want. We believe that um, teachable object recognizer can address the concerns that I mentioned um, before. Here we are assuming that users are taking around 30 photos of the object with their phone. Uh, that's why we're actually mentioning here an egocentric perspective. Um, by giving these 30 photos to the phone uh, for training, and once it actually learns um, the object, it can recognize this object later during the testing mode. Uh, this is basically the idea of the uh, teachable object recognizer. Um, so another benefit, benefit we can have from this teachable object recognizer is that we can actually allow, um, enable users to teach their own non-commercial product, such as um, the mug cup that I'm showing on the slide. Uh, once they, um, but even if um, the recognizer now can detect every single item that users teach to the recognizer, there is actually one other question we need to address. So I'm, I'm showing the image that user may take um, where uh, multiple objects appear at the same time. 
In this case, how would the users who are uh, visually impaired and the machine, I mean the system, would know which object is of interest to the users? In, actually, in this case, we need additional input from the users. Um, in, actually, in our prior work, we observed that blind participants tend to use their hand to indicate and include the object in photos, especially in the context of training object recognizer. And we believe that um, they are using a proprioception, which is the sense of knowing uh, relative positions of their body part. Um, actually, there's a uh, prior evidence that blind people use this uh, proprioception to guide hand orientation and uh, make rapid corrections. Um, inspired by this observation, um, our focus is on um, implementing object recognition that can be guided by the hand input. So in this handy guided object recognition, once user takes photo, um, including both hand and object, the system first recognizes the hand and then localize the object of interest based on hand information, such as hand pose and location. And then it crops the object from the image and uses it for classification. And our system uh, consists of two different deep learning models. Uh, one is object localization and another is object classification model. Let's first take a look at the object localization model here. Um, using fully convolutional network architecture, we first train the model to segment the hands from the egocentric images. And then we fine tune this hand model uh, to the object localization problem uh, by giving this um, uh, example. So first, I'm gonna show the original image here. And then um, this is the hand segmentation. So with this original image and hand segment image, we can train the hand model to segment the hand from the images. And then for fine tuning, we use the different um, annotation, which is localization annotation, um, where the Gaussian heat map blob indicates the center of the object of interest. Uh, for uh, training, we used uh, four different, uh, four existing data sets, such as Ego Hands, GTA, GTA Gaze Plus, and Inter Egocentric. Um, there are um, around 5,700 images in total. But the issue here, um, they are all collected by sized people, which may not represent the hand object inter interaction of people with visual impairment. So we actually did collect our own benchmark data set, which we call um, teachable object, teachable egocentric objects, um, TEGO in short. So during this data collection, there are two in, uh, individuals. One is sighted and another is blind. Um, they, are, uh, they collected images while interacting 19 different objects. When in total, we have around 11, uh, more than 11,000 images, but in, different, in, in two different phases. One is training and testing. Uh, also, please note that the data from sighted person um, merely serves as an upper baseline of this object recognition system. Uh, let me just talk a little more about the data set here. So in our data set, we have uh, two different backgrounds. One is vanilla, that is indicating plain background, and another is wild, that represent the cluttered background. And in each phase, uh, training and testing, we have uh, images without hand and with hand, uh, respectively. Um, actually, in the testing, um, as you may see on this slide, we have a uh, different uh, lighting conditions. Let me talk a little more about that as well. Um, in actually training, uh, each individual collected 30 photos per object continuously. Um, it's because um, a, per, a user may collect 30 photos uh, in a row instead of taking like 30 different photos like uh, in different time. However, in testing, we give one item, um, one item to the individual at a time. It's because, uh, and actually not it's because, um, it's because, and at the end, we collected five photos per object. And for each phase, we have a two different background. 
And especially in the testing, we have uh, three different lighting conditions. One, first one is indoor light is on, and second one is indoor light is off, and third one is indoor light is off, but the flashlight on the smartphone is on. Okay, then uh, let's talk about a little more about the object classification model here. Um, we actually used uh, Google's Inception version 3 model, which was pre-trained on a large-scale data set, uh, which is ImageNet. And then we just fine-tune this model to the, our own benchmark data set by retraining its only last layer with the data we have in the training phase in our data set. The reason why we train the last layer because we want to keep and exploit, uh, ex use the features that we learn from the large-scale data set. All right, um, let's talk about our evaluation then. So we first wanted to see uh, whether the hands are actually the natural interface for people with visual impairments when taking photos for object recognition. So for this one, actually, we used, uh, for this evaluation, we used our own uh, object localization model and um, tested it on um, two different, two existing data set from people with visual impairments. Here, uh, one is glass and vision, and another is whiz whiz. And glass and vision contains uh, around 800 in lab examples from people with low vision. And whiz whiz um, includes more than 30,000 images that are actually collected from uh, blind and low vision people. It's kind of real world examples. And especially in glass as fusion, we actually we ran uh, our object localization model on these two different, uh, two existing data set, and we found that our localization model was able to find around 16% of images that actually include the hand. And for glass sense vision and for this uh, data set, we found that there are around 18% of the data set actually include the hand. And we actually manually inspected the glasses vision to see how, how many uh, images exactly include the hand, and we found that around 44% of the data set include the hand. Um, due to the high um, number of images we have in this width, we couldn't really do the manual inspection. It's still on progress. And also, we observed that our object localization model was able to uh, localize the object from most of the images we found from uh, each of these existing data set. And then let me talk about the object classification model. I mean, the evaluation of the object classification model. So using um, this object classification model and the data from the testing phase of our own uh, benchmark data set, we, we measure the uh, we performed the experiment to see how hands in images affect the object recognition result. Uh, for this evaluation, we have uh, three different methods. One is HO, that includes the images, uh, that includes images with hands and object. And then CO uh, is basically, it's the same as HO, but the images are cropped by our own object localization model. And the O method includes the images without hand. So basically, here the CO is, is our approach. And we measure the uh, accuracy of uh, object recognition in two different environments. One is vanilla, which indicating the plain background, and then another is wild, which was representing the uh, cluttered background. Especially in the cluttered background, we observed that our um, approach, handy guide object recognition, improves the average, on av um, uh, accuracy on average uh, by 14%. Yes, um, so here are our findings. So we found that hands serve as a natural interface to include and indicate an object in photos, especially for people with visual impairments. And hands help to localize the object, especially in the cluttered uh, photos. And also, we found that it actually improved the object recognition by up to 14%. All right, so actually, this is the end of my talk. I would like to thank for um, your attention for our, uh, for our talk, and I would like to thank um, my advisor as well as the lab members for their contributions on this work. Also, the, our uh, data set, Tego data set, is available on the online, so please go ahead and play with this one, and then just share your feedback if you have. And thank you. I'm open to any questions. 
Thank you very much, Kujun. So we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Yes, over here. Center. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Yalofik from Microsoft Research. So I was wondering, how do you compare that to existing uh, both commercial system yeah. like Orcam? Or, uh, and another question is, why are you not using features like text, which is so prominent on commercial uh, uh, items that you try to recognize? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't really uh, see the, oh, question, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you said, you're asking about why, I, why we didn't use any OrCam, existing systems, and some of like text recognition system as well, right? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So actually, we want to use this teachable object recognition um, system on all different kinds of objects. So I guess, for example, um, like, a, you know, if it's just product, we can just use text recognition to read the label. But it's, there are many, like a clothes, you know, they don't really have any label there. And so that's why we didn't really consider text recognition in the beginning. But actually, but it actually can enhance the recognition result. We believe that. So, but I haven't really tested and evaluated the approach yet. And also, I, the organ we think about it, but actually, I don't think the OrCam, I think it's now OrCam is available to uh, recognize the face only, not the object. I think that's why we didn't um, uh, go, I mean, we didn't go ahead using those and comparing it with our um, recognition system. I hope, yeah, that answers the question. The second question over here. Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, please. Yes, um, th thank you for this work. It's really lovely work. And as somebody who uses a lot of these um, applications and things, just one thought, uh, it's really difficult to take a picture using a screen reader on a phone. And I'm just wondering if you might have better luck if you had somebody actually taking video with maybe audio cueing from you to sort of say, put the phone down and rotate the object in front of the camera so you can automatically collect as many data samples from the video post hoc as you need, but it might be much easier interaction to get better quality. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we totally agree uh, on that point. And we're actually working on um, that, um, you know, what it, uh, the, the feedback you gave in two different phases. One is the teachable interface, and another one is the feedback and video as well. And we believe that the video is gonna help a lot um, to recognize, actually detect and recognize the object because it has temporal information. And we could kind of extract uh, the images and frames that have a kind of high salient, saliency of the object. Um, also, we're actually thinking about, so now we actually didn't do anything about uh, getting the label from the user, but we are thinking about getting the label through the audio input as well. Yeah, and you can also provide instructions like rotate or whatever, you could actually guide. Right, right, like a non-visual feedback. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We are actually working on that as well. We can actually talk after that, um, after this uh, presentation. Thanks for the feedback, yes. Okay, so let's thank Kyunjun again.